That's a lot of rhymes. Okay. So before we go any further in our discussion in this uh, history of atoms and specifically the structure of the atom itself, because as I said at this time, 1910, we know that the atom is the smallest particle of an element and it's actually made up of two subatomic particles, protons found in the very small core of the nucleus and the electrons migrating around in the rest of the space of making up the atom. We have to spend one day today talking about physics. And today we're gonna to talk about light and electromagnetic radiation because we need to have some understanding of that before we can talk any more about the structure of the atom itself. Now, light has always puzzled physicists. They really didn't know what it was. And one of the major questions in physics has always been, what is light composed of? Is light composed of particles? Is it a stream of particles coming from the sun towards you? Or is it a wave type phenomenon like in the ocean, how water moves in waves along the surface of the ocean? And this question was actually answered in 1661 by a famous experiment known as the two slit experiment. And what was done is somebody took a light source and you can imagine this might be a flashlight here. And the flashlight was shining light onto a piece of paper that had two slits in it. And behind that piece of paper was another screen. And so the physicists of the time said, okay, if we shine this light onto that paper with the two slits, and if light is composed of particles, if the particles hit that first piece of paper, of course, they'll be blocked. But if they miss the paper and go through the slits, they're going to travel all the way to the screen at the back, and they're going to strike the screen in the back, and you're going to see two illuminated stripes. Does that make sense? That's what would happen if light behaves as particles. But if light behaves as waves, and now I have my little light source, my little flashlight at the bottom here now, and if the light is emanating from the flashlight <clears throat> in waves, much like waves on an ocean emanate, so each of these curved lines would represent a big wave front. That's a big wave front. The wave front's going to impinge upon my paper with the two slits. And an interesting thing about waves, and you can actually do this in the bathtub if you want, you can set up a little slit experiment yourself and have the waves go towards the slit. Once the waves pass through the slit, they start propagating again. So you're going to get wave ripples coming from the right slit and wave, uh, <clears throat> wave uh, curves propagating from the other slit as well. And as these two uh, wave patterns start to impose upon each other, and you can see right here they're overlapping, some really interesting things happen. And so let's think about what happens there. If you imagine, if you're a surfer, you would probably know this. If you're out in the ocean and there are two waves that are, let's say, each one foot high. And those two waves are uh, approaching on each other. What if this wave and this wave exactly meet at this point right here? Do you know what the wave's gonna look like when it gets to that dot there? Pretty choppy. <laughs> uh, theoretically, if it's just everything's flat except for those two waves, when those two waves intersect at this dot, you're going to add their amplitudes together. And for a brief instant, those two one-foot waves will merge into a two-foot wave, and they'll pass right through each other and be one-foot waves again. So when two crests on the ocean overlap, they add their amplitudes together. That's called constructive interference. And not only do waves on the ocean do that, but light waves will do that as well. So if two light waves interact with each other or overlap each other, they will double their amplitude, which means they become twice as bright, okay? Now, think about this. What if you have in the ocean a crest and a trough, and the crest is one foot and the trough is one foot? What happens when those overlap with each other? Do their amplitudes cancel out? Because they're no the opposite, plus one foot, minus one foot, when they intersect with each other, their amplitude will completely cancel out to zero, and then they'll pass through each other and exist how they did before. When a crest and a trough interact with each other, that's called uh, destructive interference because they cancel each other out. So light waves will do that as well. If you have a crest and a trough overlapping, the light will cancel out, you won't see anything. So constructive interference increases the intensity of light, destructive in interference decreases the intensity of light. So here's my two slits that are right here on this uh, picture here on the left. Here I've got the two little slits 
And so all these light waves are emanating from the left slit. All these white waves are emanating from the right slit. And it's a complex picture, but there's a lot of little spots where these lines <laughs> intersect with each other. Anytime they intersect, that's where a crest and a crest are overlapping. So all these little points here are crest, crest overlaps. That means they're gonna double the amplitude. This is where the light's gonna be really, really bright. But halfway between those orange lines are places where a crest and a trough are intersecting or overlapping. That's gonna be these blue lines. And as we just said, if a crest and a trough intersect with each other, they cancel out. So what you're gonna see is you're gonna see a bright light, no light, bright light, no light, bright light, no light, bright light, no light, bright light, like that. This is the picture that you're gonna see on the screen behind if light behaves as waves. So we would expect something like this. So when they did this experiment in 1661 to try to verify whether light is composed of particles or waves, which picture did they see on the screen in the back? The one on the left or the one on the right? The right. One on the right. One on the right. So light produces this type of pattern, which we call a diffraction pattern, that proved that light is composed of waves. It's a wave phenomenon. It is not a stream of particles. Okay, so we've known that now for over 300 years. Okay, light is a wave type phenomenon. So let's talk about wave phenomenons now for a few minutes. So if you imagine the ocean, waves have crests and troughs. And so if you draw a baseline with my dotted line here, the highest point on the graph of the wave phenomenon is called a crest, and the lowest point is called a trough. Okay. Now, a couple of properties we're going to measure about uh, waves is first amplitude. And that's how much displacement the crest or the trough has from that dotted line that's going right down the middle. So that's called amplitude. It's abbreviated by the capital A, and it's the maximum disturbance in the medium during one wave cycle. So if you go through one complete wave cycle, what's the highest the wave got or the lowest the wave got? That's called its maximum disturbance, and that's called the amplitude. In terms of visible light, amplitude is related to intensity of light. So really bright lights have big amplitudes and very faint lights have small amplitudes. Another property that's actually going to be more important is the property of wavelength. And wavelength is actually the distance between two sequential uh, crests. So I've got my picture here, the first uh, crest way over here on the left and the second crest way over on the right. <laughs> that's called the wavelength, bless you. Because if you go from the first crest to the second crest, you've made one complete cycle. So they call that one wavelength. So it's the straight distance between uh, sequential crests. Okay, We're going to deal with wavelength quite a bit because that's going to be very important today. The other property that's important is a little bit more nebulous. It's called frequency. It looks like it's abbreviated by the Greek letter, uh, by the letter V, but it's actually the Greek letter nu. And so fortunately, it looks a lot like a V, but it's nu is what it is. The wavelength symbol is the Greek letter lambda. So that's a lambda, and that's a nu. So if you become a, a sorority or fraternity member someday, then you'll have to memorize all those Greek letters, which will actually help if you ever go to Greece. So what the frequency is, <clears throat> it's how many cycles you can complete in a particular amount of time. So if I want to show you what frequency is, let me change my pictures at the top. Let me draw two different wave phenomena. And let's say these two wave phenomenons take one second to go from the left of their picture to the right of the picture. So the amount of time is one second. So if you look at the left picture, how many complete wave cycles are you making in that one second period? A three. That's right. So we would say the frequency of that first wave phenomenon is three waves per second. Okay. And in the second one, if you count those one, two, three, four, five, six, that's six waves per second. <clears throat> So when we talk about frequency, we mean how many waves you make per second. Now, I want you to notice something. Which one of these two pictures has the highest frequency? The right one. What do you notice about the wavelength of the one on the right? It's shorter. So that's really important for you to see. If you have a really high frequency, that means the wavelength has to be small. Look at the left picture. If you have a small frequency, that means the wavelength has to be big. There's a word for that mathematically. It's called inversely related. So wavelength and frequency for any wave type phenomenon are inversely related. 
Um, how is there's an equation that relates them? <clears throat> there is. So back when you were taking algebra in your younger days and you had an equation like this, okay, what does the graph look like for that equation? A line. Like this. And because there's a positive number here, the slope goes up. You're graphing this variable and this variable. What sides of the equal sign are they on? Opposite sides, right? Yeah. If you have variables that you're graphing that are on opposite sides of an equation, you get something that's called directly proportional because as the Y value gets bigger, the X value gets bigger. That's the equation for a direct proportion. Now, what's happening here is we have wavelength and frequency are inversely related. So the equation for two things that are inversely related is they're on the same side of the equation. Can you see how this is different than y equals mx? Yeah, Here there are I different just, sides, directly wasn't related. There, Go ahead, sorry. sorry. Wasn't there um, something else too? We'll get to that, yeah. Okay. And I just wanna make a mathematical point for people that maybe not realize this from algebra. If you have an equation where the two variables are on opposite sides of an equation, that's the telltale sign of a direct relation. But if the two variables are on the same side of the equation, they multiply to make a constant, and they actually make a graph that looks like this, that's inversely related. And that's what's happening here. So because we have an inverse relationship, hmm, where am I here? Because these are inversely related, frequency and wavelength have to multiply to make a constant. And Ms. Quigley may have been working her way towards this. That constant is called the speed. It's how fast the wave phenomenon's traveling. So for any wave property, wavelength times frequency always multiplies to make a constant, and that constant is the speed of the particular wave phenomenon. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Go ahead. Sorry, I keep talking. Um, is it what? It, isn't it the speed of light or no? This is for, this is the equation for a generic wave phenomenon like waves in an ocean. What you're talking about is only if we're talking about light, and I'm not quite there yet. Okay. Sorry. So this is the true. That's fine. This is a true statement for any wave phenomenon. Okay. Now, what Ms. Quigley has been anxious to get to so is your high the light. Go ahead. Uh, we said just to cap everything. We said high frequency has short waves and low frequency has high waves. Yes, you need waves. to know that. Yep. Thank. You. Yep. <clears throat> so visible light is one type of phenomenon known as electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic radiation are any form of energy that can, and if whoever's, uh, Mr. Hosseinian, maybe you wanna turn off your volume because I think it's giving a little feedback. So, or, and maybe other people are too. So if you have your volume on, if you wanna turn it off just until you wanna ask a question. So electromagnetic radiation is any form of energy that consists of oscillating electric and magnetic fields, that's the wave phenomenon, that travels at a constant speed. And this speed is actually called the speed of light and it's 2.9979 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And it turns out that light is a form of electromagnetic radiation. <clears throat> now, what differentiates light from other forms of electromagnetic radiation? Because other forms are things like radio waves, gamma rays, X-rays, infrared light, ultraviolet light, those are all forms of electromagnetic radiation. Well, they're all defined by their wavelengths. Visible light has a certain range of wavelengths. X-rays have a different range of wavelengths. Gamma rays have a different range of wavelengths. <clears throat> this is Satchel Page. I don't know if you know who Satchel Page is, but Satchel Page was actually one of the best baseball players of all time. Great athlete. Satchel Page was a fast runner. He could hit, he could throw. And the, the story was about Satchel Page is when Satchel Page went to bed at night, when he would turn the light switch off in his room, he would be in bed before it's dark. Do you like that story? What does that mean? That's impossible. Satchel Page, no, it's not impossible. It just means Satchel Page can move faster than the speed of light, which is what the joke was. Do you know what the speed of light is in a... Uh, in English units, because 2.9979 times 10 to the eighth meters per second doesn't mean much to me. How fast does light travel? Miles per hour, miles per second, what do you think? Any idea? 
Isn't it like 2,500 miles or no? Per? Like, it's oh, uh, per second. It's actually much faster than that. It's 186,000 miles per second. Light oh. travels really fast. You know how fast sound travels? About it's 700 miles per hour. Light travels 186,000 miles per second. The moon is about 246,000 miles away from the earth. So that means it takes light about one and a half seconds to get from the moon to here. So anytime you look at the moon, you're always seeing the moon one and a half seconds in the past. The sun is 93 million miles away from the earth. It takes sunlight about six minutes to get to the earth. So every time you look up at the sun, you're seeing what the sun looked like six minutes ago because that's finally it's light getting there. But it's really, really fast. So I just always like the satchel page story. I thought it was really cute. So light is definitely a form of electromagnetic radiation. And the different types of electromagnetic radiation differ only in their wavelengths and frequencies. So different blocks of wavelengths, we call them different names for their form of electromagnetic radiation. And I'm gonna give you a little chart here of the different forms of electromagnetic radiation going from shortest wavelength to longest wavelength. So I'd like you to know uh, each of these different forms. So electromagnetic radiation is broken up into reading from left to right gamma rays. Those have really short wavelengths. If the wavelengths get longer, then they become X-rays. If the wavelengths get even longer, then we change the name to ultraviolet. If the wavelengths get even longer than that, we change the name to visible light. Longer wavelengths are now called infrared radiation. Longer wavelengths still are microwaves and the longest wavelengths of all are radio waves. So they're going from shortest wavelength to longest wavelength. And Mr. Osenian can now appreciate what's written at the bottom here. If you have short wavelengths, you have high frequencies, right? So gamma rays have the highest frequencies. And then the radio waves, which have the really long wavelengths, have the lowest or smallest frequencies, all right? Now, I want to focus in on the visible light part of this, OK? There, the, the, the lines here that separate, oh, I didn't want to do that yet. Curses, stop. You don't see that. Oh, look at this. I'm, oh, share screen, stop. I put that. I panic sometimes. Okay, let's see. Here it is. Try again. Oh, no, y'all saw it. It's all spoiled, but oh well. So these lines that separate gamma rays from X rays, X rays from ultraviolet, infrared from microwaves, microwaves from radio waves, those are all arbitrarily picked. But these two lines here that separate the visible light from ultraviolet and infrared are defined. And they're defined because visible light happen to be the wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation that when they impact the molecules in our eyes, they cause a chemical reaction to occur and our optic nerve senses the uh, acquisition of those uh, wavelengths and we have the phenomenon known as sight. So the molecules in your eyes are sensitive to uh, electromagnetic radiation wavelengths that range from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. And so that's why this block of the electromagnetic radiation scale is called visible light. Now, different creatures have different molecules in their eyes. Moths, for example, have different molecules in their eyes and they're sensitive to a wider range of wavelengths. Moths can actually detect wavelengths down around 200 and 300 nanometers. So if you were a class of moths, the visible light region would go from 200 to 700. But you're not moths, you're humans. And so this is the electromagnetic radiation scale uh, for humans. So the only numerical values I would like you to know in this whole graph is I want you to know the upper and lower wavelengths for visible light. I want you to know violet light has wavelengths of around 400 nanometers. And then red light, which is the top, has wavelengths of 700. And you can see how the colors go as you go from 700 down to 600, down to 500, down to 400. The colors go through the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, Roy G. Bibb. OK? <clears throat> now, moments ago, we said that all wave phenomena obey this inverse relationship equation. Wavelength times frequency equals speed. If you're talking specifically about electromagnetic radiation, we now know what the speed of electromagnetic radiation is. It's the speed of light. So therefore, the frequency of electromagnetic radiation multiplied by its wavelength has to equal the speed of light. And the speed of light is usually abbreviated by the letter C. And so this relationship here, 
uh, lambda times nu equals C is going to be true for electromagnetic radiation. That's the first equation you will need to know for this semester. Okay? That equation for electromagnetic radiation. Let's try an example of that. <clears throat> Let's see if we can find the wavelength of electromagnetic radiation if it has a frequency of 2.4 times 10 to the 14th. And the units for frequency should be waves per second. But quite often, because a wave is not a metric unit, they just leave it out. And if you leave the wave out, you just have per second. And so the units are just per seconds. And you could write it 1 over seconds if you want, or use that little fancy algebra way to write seconds in the denominator by going s to the negative 1 power. So if you know the frequency of electromagnetic radiation and you want to determine what its wavelength is, you have to use this relationship that's always true for electromagnetic radiation, wavelength times frequency equals speed of light. Um, professor? Go for it. What, what, is the, what are the units for frequency again? What is, what is S1? Is, frequency is how many waves you make second, correct? Mm-hmm. So okay. it would be waves divided by seconds, but they quite often leave the word waves out because it's not actually a metric unit. So if you have nothing in the numerator and you go per second, the units are just per seconds. So you'll quite often see the frequency of units written exactly how it is here, just seconds to the minus one or one over seconds, but that really means waves per second. They just leave the waves out. Okay, got it, thank you. Okay. So if we want to actually calculate what the wavelength is, we're just going to solve this equation for wavelength, and we're going to plug the two numbers in. So the speed of light is not something you will need to memorize. You can just look it up for your homework. I would actually write it on test one for you so you would see it there. It's 2.9979 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And the frequency they gave us in the problem is 2.4 times 10 to the 14th seconds to the minus one. The seconds to the minus one in the denominator means one over seconds. This is one over seconds, so they cancel out. All that's left over is meters. When I get my answer, how many significant figures is my answer gonna be? Two. two. The top number is five significant figures, the bottom number is two. We're not given any tolerances, so you're gonna use the simplified rule, just take whichever factor has the least number of significant figures, and that's how many your answer should have. So that's gonna be two. This answer comes out 1.8 times 10 to the minus six meters. Okay, so if you know a frequency, you can calculate a wavelength. If you know a wavelength, you can calculate a frequency. Now from yesterday, we did some metric conversions. So a part B to this might be, could you convert this wavelength into nanometers? And then you would have to go to the metric prefix chart and go, hmm, let's see, meter is a base unit at 10 to the zero. Nano is at 10 to the minus ninth. So one big meter would have to equal 10 to the ninth nanometers. So I would expect you to be able to deduce this equality statement by thinking about the metric prefix chart from yesterday. And then if you know that, we can now take the 1.2 times 10 to the minus six meters and multiply it by this equality statement written as a fraction to make the meters cancel out. And think about how that would have to look. You would have to put the one meter on the bottom so meters cancel out and the 10 to the ninth nanometers on the top. And the, once they've canceled out, the units are now nanometers you've now calculated what the wavelength is in nanometers instead. You'll see problems like this for a uh, homework 1B, which will be due on Monday of next week. <clears throat> Let me ask you one conceptual question before we leave this page. If you just now calculated what the wavelength is of this electromagnetic radiation, what type of electromagnetic radiation do you think it is? Is it a radio wave? And tell me how you deduce that. Well, it wasn't within the color range. Oh my goodness, that's exactly what I wanted you to do. So here's the visible range, 400 to 700. This is visible light, okay? So this number that we just got, 1.2 times 10 to the third is 1200 nanometers. So it's gotta be greater than visible light. So in our spectrum here, and remember 700 was red and 400 was violet. Here's the next two regions past the visible spectrum. See if this will make sense. If 700 is red, then above 700 has to be beyond red. That's the infrared. Below 400, which is violet, has to be less than violet. That'd be ultraviolet. So the 1200 is maybe infrared. It's maybe 
uh, microwaves, because that's the next one. It may be radio waves. You really have no idea which one it is, but if you picked any one of those three answers, which you did, I would accept that. It turns out 1200 is only slightly higher than 700, so it's actually infrared radiation. If the wavelength was less than 400, it could be ultraviolet, it could be x-rays, it could be gamma rays, and it could be any one of those because I haven't expected you to learn any numerical data about that. But in this particular problem, I just wanted you to verify that 1200 was outside of the range of 400 to 700, so it has to be above uh, visible light, and those would be either infrared, microwaves, or radio waves, but this one just turns out to be infrared radiation. But I would have accepted your answer. That sounded really good. So nice job on that. Okay. Professor. Yep. Um, I got a hard time um, using my calculator correctly. I don't know if, um, you know, we can maybe practice later or, or just kind of go over what I'm doing wrong. But I couldn't get that answer from, from one point, you know, one two to the 10 to the negative six meter meters. I couldn't get that either. Wrong. So. You're going to type in 1.2 exponent 3. Those are the buttons you have to push. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You have an exponent button. Don't press this. Don't go times 10 to a power. It's 1.2 exponent 3 because that means 1.2 times 10 to the third. I'm trying to locate my exponent. Some button. calculators say EE. -E. Others say EXP. Do you have one of those $500 calculators that's graphing? Definitely not. $10 okay. Walmart. <laughs> so you should have an EXP button on there. So hold the it. EX button. EXP. Hold your calculator up. Let me see it. Let's see. Talk so I can, so it'll go on to you. Talk. Oh. There um, you go. Okay. Talk. Yeah, sorry. I think maybe it's the one at the bottom says times 10 to the X. It actually has written out times 10 to the X on it. That's what yeah, I've been using. I have that calculator. So yeah, you're going to use um, times 10 to the X. So you go, you would go um, one time, you would press one and then press that button times 10 to the X. Okay. And then you would insert the power. If it's negative, then you insert negative and then the number. Or if it's positive, you just enter the number. And then you can go ahead and do the, the regular functions like you uh, would regularly do. Okay, so I got 1.2 times 10 to the x and put three. Got and it. You go times, right? Okay. And you're going to go one times 10 to the x, nine, because 10 to the ninth is one times 10 to the ninth. Got it. Okay. And equals. I got 1.2 times 10 to the 12. Oh, because I blew that for some reason. So let's see. Oh, because this was negative third, right? No, this was negative something else. What was this? I put, yeah, I put third there. It was negative six, I think. So let's, we have to go oh. back. I think it was 1.2 times 10 to the, you had to go negative six. Okay. Times one to the time times one to 10 to the ninth, I guess. That should do it. Okay. And I got 1200. Now you're cooking with gas. Thank you. Okay. Thanks everybody. Okay, so I want you to be able to do calculations like that. Now let's move up to the year 1900. There was a physicist whose name was Max Planck and he was watching how light interacted with matter. When you go to the beach and you lay out on the beach, you do that because you want to be tan. What's happening? Ultraviolet radiation from the sun is impinging upon your skin. It's depositing energy on your skin. That energy is significant enough to break melanin molecules in your cells. And when those molecules break, they absorb light differently and they get dark. And so you turn tan or dark or you actually sunburn. So he was looking at how light and electromagnetic radiation interacts with matter. And he came up with a proposition he proposed that the energy of the electromagnetic radiation, like the energy from the sun that's touching your skin when you lay out on the beach, is only gained or lost in small finite amounts. And he called those small finite amounts quanta. 
He proposed the first ever quantum theory. That's any theory that predicts the values for a property are restri restricted to multiples of some small elementary unit. So he was applying a quantum theory to electromagnetic radiation, saying electromagnetic radiation can only transfer its energy in little small packages. So for example, if you're laying out on the beach and the ultraviolet radiation is hitting your forehead to turn it tan, what's happening is uh, when the waves of electromagnetic radiation hit you, they're depositing one joule of energy. And then another one does a second joule of energy, then a third joule of energy, little packages of one joule. But he said, you cannot deposit 1.3 joules of energy on your skin. The energy is only deposited in specific small packages. You can't have a fraction of a package. And he has a name for that small package of energy that gets deposited when electromagnetic radiation hits an object. And that small package of energy of electromagnetic radiation is called a photon. So he proposed that a photon is a particle of electromagnetic radiation acting as a packet of energy that's carrying his quanta of energy to deposit onto your forehead when the light strikes you at the beach. Does this definition upset anybody? Who's upset by this? Ms. Quigley, have I bothered you with this? What's wrong with this? Um, it's because... It's a particle, not a wave. Oh my yeah. gosh, didn't we just learn that light was waves? And what's, what's this Planck saying? He's saying light is acting as particles? This is Plus inconceivable. Person. This is called wave-particle duality. He's proposing it is when light travels through space, it acts like waves. When it interacts with matter, it acts as particles. And specifically, he said, the energy that that photon has, its little package of energy, which I'm going to call E, it depends upon the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation. So if you know the frequency, you can predict what the energy is of these little packets of electromagnetic radiation. So the photon energy depends upon the electromagnetic radiation frequency and they're directly related, which means the mathematical equation I'm about to show you will show energy on one side of the equal sign and frequency on the other side of the equal sign. Look at that equation. E equals H nu. Energy's on the left, frequency's on the right. That means they're directly related. And there's a little constant in the equation. It's now been named after Planck. It's called Planck's constant. You will not need to memorize it. I would give this to you on the test, but numerically it's 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th joule seconds. So according to Planck, the higher the frequency, the higher the energy of the photons. So if we go back to this little chart that you had a few minutes ago, where we have the short wavelengths on the left and the long wavelengths on the right, which then also means high frequency on the left, low frequency on the right. Well, look what it says frequency. If you have high frequency, like the gamma rays, that means their photons have high energy. If you have radio waves that are low frequency, that means their photons have low energy. Hmm. This is and why you... Oh, Go ahead. Go sorry. Ahead. Doesn't like the level that the photon jumps to that determines its color? The photon's not jumping. You're thinking about electrons in an atom, so we're not quite there yet. Oh, so it's just a sorry. photon has an innate amount of energy. So radio waves, because their photons have low energy, you can walk outside your house and K-Rock radio waves are actually bombarding you as they fly off some big radio tower somewhere in Los Angeles, and they're going through you. And all those K-Rock radio waves, they have no effect on your body because their photons are such low energy. Ms. Quigley is not going to go down to the dentist office and ask, can I stand in front of the x-ray machine for about five minutes and have all the x-rays hit me? Because their photons have high energy 
And when those photons go into your body, they break molecules and they can actually kill cells and kill organs. And that's really, really bad. So you can handle low energy photons, but you can't handle high energy photons. So things with high frequencies have high energy photons, low frequencies have low energy photons. And now that we know this Planck uh, expression or this equation, this is now the second equation I'm gonna expect you to know for our first test. You can now find the energy of any type of photons as long as you know their frequency. So let's try this. Let's find the energy of red light photons if the light has a frequency of 3.0 times 10 to the 14th seconds to the minus one. So if you ever wanna find the energy and you know the frequency, the relationship between them is this. You just have to look up Planck's constant and multiply Planck's constant by the given frequency. And that's how you're gonna tell the energy of the individual photons. So Planck's constant 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th joule seconds. The frequency 3.0 times 10 to the 14th seconds to the minus one. The seconds to the minus one means it's in the denominator. This second's in the numerator. They cancel out. The answer comes out in joules. And the answer would have to be two significant figures because of the 3.0. So I get 2.0 times 10 to the minus 19th joules. That's a really small number because you've calculated the energy of one single photon. So each photon of red light would have an energy of 2.0 times 10 to the minus 19th joules. So you'll see calculations like this on your homework from Monday as well, okay? So we have two electromagnetic radiation equations, one that relates wavelength and frequency, and then this one that relates frequency and energy. Let me give you one more little more difficult problem. Let's see if we can calculate the energy of green light photons if they have a wavelength of 5.00 times 10 to the minus seventh meters. So if the question is asking you, what is the energy of the photons, you have to use this equation. So what's wrong with the problem? Why is this more difficult than the previous one? We don't know. Have to constant. solve for. You don't know the frequency yet. So you can't do this until you use the original equation and solve for the frequency. So we've got to do a two-step process. I'm going to take my original equation, which is at the bottom here, wavelength times frequency equals speed of light. I'm going to solve that for the frequency so that I can therefore plug that back into my top equation. So if we want to solve for the frequency, that's going to be the speed of light, 2.9979 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, divided by the given wavelength, 5.00 times 10 to the minus seventh. The meters will cancel out, and we're left over with per seconds, or I can write it seconds to the minus one. This frequency will come out how many significant figures? Three. It'll be three, but this is not the final answer to our problem, right? We're trying to get the energy of the photons. So here's something I want you to do if you're doing a multiple step problem. Even though you know this answer should be three significant figures, don't round it to three significant figures. Keep the entire number in your calculator, or if that's impossible to do, keep at least one extra digit. That little green digit there, that six, which is not a significant figure, it's an extra digit, we call a guard digit. So in multiple step calculations, always carry at least one guard digit so that you actually don't round multiple times in a problem, which actually propagates the tolerance and it causes your answer to have a bigger range of tolerance, which means it's less accurate. So if you can keep the whole number in your calculator, that would actually be better. But if you have to write it down, at least keep one extra digit. So I'm gonna color it green. You can actually put a bar over it or under it or something just so you know that it's really not a significant figure. And now you can go back to our first equation, E equals H nu, and we can now actually use this frequency and multiply it by Planck's constant, and we can calculate uh, what the energy of the photons are gonna be. <clears throat> So I'm multiplying 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th joule seconds, which is a four significant figure number by the frequency 5.996 times 10 to the 14th, which is really a three significant figure number. So when I get my answer, I'm gonna have to round my answer back to three significant figures. So whatever your calculator says, it'll say something like 3.973, blah, 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 times 10 to the minus 19th. You round it to 3.97 times 10 to the minus 19th. 
Professor, what if we get 2.9979 to the 10 to the 8 milliseconds? That's what, the speed what was that? I missed it. That's the speed of oh. light. That'll be given to you. You can just look it up for any homework problems you need. Thank you. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Lovely. Now, watch this. Now, go into your past. We haven't talked about this yet. Let's see what you can do. We've calculated. Let's just go back. This number at the bottom, 3.97 times 10 to the minus 19th joules is the energy of one photon of green light. That's what this equation calculates. Could you calculate the energy of one mole of the green light photons? What does that mean? 6.02 times the 10 to the 23rd. It's a word that chemists use to mean a large specific number, much like people who work in donut shops use the word dozen to mean 12. Chemists use the word mole to mean 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd of some small objects. They could be atoms, they could be electrons, they could be molecules, they could be photons. So if you want the energy of a mole of photons, that means you're trying to calculate the energy of 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd photons. And the way you do that from your previous answer is you have to realize that when you use the equation E equals H nu and you solve for E, you're calculating the energy of a single photon. So you could have written the answer a little bit more specifically like this. It's 3.97 times 10 to the minus 19 joules per a single photon. If you put that single photon in the bottom, now you can take this equality statement I have written here, write it as a fraction, and put the fraction the correct way so that the photons will cancel out. So if you want the photons to cancel out, you put 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd photons on the top, and you put one mole on the bottom. Photons cancel out, and you'll have the number of joules for a mole of photons. And that comes out 2.39 times 10 to the fifth joules per mole. We'll have you do that on Monday's homework as well. So even though we haven't officially talked about the concept of mole, I'm going to sort of rely a little bit on that. Maybe you've heard that once or twice in your life and you might be able to know what that is. <clears throat> now, that's a big number. It's 239,000 joules per mole because that's kind of a a large number to deal with. Usually when they talk about the energy of a mole of photons, they do it in kilojoules instead of joules. So if I ask you then what would be the energy of a mole of photons in kilojoules instead of in joules, you need to do a metric conversion. Kilos at 10 to the third, a joule is a base unit 10 to the zero. That means one big kilojoule equals 10 to the third little joules. So that equality statement, I can take my 2.39 times 10 to the fifth joules per mole and just multiply it by that equality statement to try to make the joules cancel out. So I'd put the 10 to the third joules on the bottom and the one kilojoule on the top. Joules would cancel out and I'd get my answer in kilojoules per mole. That's a little bit easier number to deal with, 239. Professor, are you going to have this uploaded uh, later on day so we can take a look at this meeting? I'll try to do that, yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, does that make sense so far? So we started the period. We told you that light has been proven to be a wave-type phenomenon. And now at the end of the period, I'm telling you that this guy, Max Planck, says, well, it's a wave phenomenon when it's traveling through space. But when it interacts with matter, it's acting like particles. Do you believe it? I think Mr. Asanian believes it. Seems pretty far-fetched. Yeah, it does seem pretty far-fetched because you know what? It hasn't explained any natural phenomenon. There's no reason for us to explain it. We believe things are made of atoms because that explains the law of definite proportion or definite composition. But why would we believe this? Well, people didn't at first. But five years later, Albert Einstein was reading Planck's quantum theory and said, oh my goodness, if Planck's theory is correct, it can explain something that physicists have known for a long time, but they had no idea why. It could explain something called the photoelectric effect. So the only reason we believe Planck is correct and that light actually acts as particles when it interacts with matter 
is because Einstein wrote a paper and he said, if Planck's quantum theory about light is correct, then the photoelectric effect can be explained. And let me show you what the photoelectric effect is. Here's a piece of metal. People would take light and shine it onto that piece of metal. And if you were to shine a red light onto this piece of metal, it turns out that nothing happens, all right? But if you shine a blue light onto the piece of metal, all of a sudden electrons start flying off of that metal slab. And in fact, if you measure the speed of the electrons, they're actually fairly low speed, but the significant thing is the blue light causes electrons to come off. If you shine ultraviolet light onto that piece of metal, electrons are flying off as well, but they're flying off at really high speeds. And this is known as the photoelectric effect. Sometimes light can cause electrons to be emitted from a piece of metal. Why was that? People didn't know. People thought, wow, that red light's not doing anything. So what if I take a really intense red light and shine that? No electrons came off. If you shine a blue light that's feeble or intense, electrons are flying off, nobody could figure out what was going on. And Einstein explained what was happening. He said, if Planck is correct and red light interacts with matter as little packages of energy, what's the energy of a red light photon? It was a small number. We calculated it earlier today, two times 10 to the minus 19th joules. Now, if you wanna kick an electron off the piece of metal, it's gonna take a certain amount of energy. It's like if I see Mr. Julian in, at somewhere like at the store or something, and I want to knock a tooth out of his mouth, I have to hit him with a certain amount of right? Because if I just go like this, boink, his tooth isn't going to come out. I have to smack him with a certain amount of energy. So if you want to pull an electron out of a piece of metal, it takes a certain amount of energy. That energy, let's say, is 3 times 10 to the minus 19th joules. So look at that photon of red light. Its energy is 2 times 10 to the minus 19th but you need to have three times 10 to the minus 19th to kick the electron off. Is a red photon ever gonna cause an electron to be ejected off of that metal? What no. if you send a million red photons? Every time they hit, two, 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 it never gonna happen. So Einstein said, red light will never emit a photon, be, never emit an electron, because the photons don't have enough energy to do that. But what's the energy of, so not enough energy to remove the electron? But what's the energy of blue light photons? They're higher. If a blue light photon's energy is four times 10 to the minus 19th and it hits the piece of metal, that has enough energy to remove the electron. It will use three times 10 to the minus 19th joules to pull the electron off and guess how much energy the electron's gonna have as it's flying away. Figure it out. One times ten, one to, the times ten to the ninth. Four minus three is one. It's going to escape with one joule of energy. And everybody read Einstein's paper and they went, oh my gosh, it's got to be true. I think Planck is right. And Einstein won the Nobel Prize for this. This is the only thing he ever won a Nobel Prize for, his explanation of the photoelectric effect. Okay. So that's it for today. So we have uh, the... COVID-19 form due tomorrow morning by 7.15. At 7.30, you're going to try to take your practice proctorio test. 8 o'clock, we'll have our Zoom conference for activity one, and activity one will be due at 11. And then at 12 o'clock, we'll have home, extra homework 1B due. And at 12.15, we do our next lecture. Otherwise, I think that's it for today. I hope you had a lovely morning. And I'll try to get those things posted for Mr. Osenian and anybody else sometime by the end of the day. Uh, thank you, Professor. That thank you, Professor. Thank you. 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 You too. Thank you, Professor. Fine. Peace we'll out, Professor. Ask your question. Real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Um, thank you for um, your explanations. Are just amazing. Uh, it's really is. Um, That's because I'm, I'm learning. Like, yeah. Thank you. Um, um, I'm a little bit frustrated, Professor. Uh, I think something's wrong with my calculator. Can we adjust that right now? Because Right I now, get I'm ready to start my next class. I do have office hours today from 1045 to 12. Are you free at that time? 1045 till what time? Till 12. And I'll see you at 1045, Professor. And you know how to get to the office hours, all right? Uh, let me make...
sure um, to go uh, to our um, uh, Candice. Uh, I see all this. Yeah, I'm looking for a Canvas to show you, but I don't have one. Yeah. yeah. It, it, go to Canvas and just on the front page of Canvas. Yeah, click the link for Wednesday at 1045. Okay. okay. Thank you. Professor. We'll see you at 1045. Yep. I'll see you then. Bye-bye. Thank you.